Hi, world history. This is Miss Corey coming in with U13 on two. What is imperialism? So welcome to Unit 13. There's a lot going on in Unit 13. Some of the videos are a little bit on the longer side too. You're like, oh my gosh, Miss Corey, why is this so long? No, it's not me talking the whole time. What I do is I take other videos and I put them in, like for information and stuff. So it's not just me. They're more entertaining than you might think. Maybe. Anyway, learning targets. Describe European imperialism. We'll talk a little bit about specifics at the end here. So your job is going to be kind of like normal. Watch the Ed Puzzle. Answer the questions. Any question in blue text are questions that I want you to answer directly on the Ed Puzzle. Make sure you're following along with your study guide. Important concepts on the study guide will be in red text. And of course, if you have questions, let us know. We are here for that. So first question for you is what do you know about imperialism or what do you think when you hear imperialism? So some of you might not know what imperialism is, which is totally fine. To be completely honest, I didn't know what imperialism was either until like <laughs> I took a class in college about imperialism. So I get it, but that's okay, because for the next two weeks, we're going to learn a lot about imperialism. So just a heads up, this unit does talk about some deeper topics like slavery, genocide, human mutilation. Some pictures might be graphic, but I'll try to give you a heads up if that is going to be the case. And of course, let us know if you do have any questions or concerns. So imperialism, the basic definition of it is the idea of one country takes over another territory in order to exploit that territory for its labor and or its natural resources. So the dominating country controls that territory's political, economic, and social life. And the domination of territory is done through harsh military or economic tactics. Most of the time, it's military tactics. So. Here's a photo from the 1880s in a gold mine in South Africa. From this photo, what details show how the Africans were treated? Yeah, we're gonna learn a lot about maltreatment of many people around the world because of imperialism. So you might think, wow, haven't we seen many countries, kingdom, empires do this throughout history? Yes, imperialism has existed pretty much since human history has existed. So there are a ton of different examples of imperialism that we've talked about in this class. Genghis Khan with the Mongol Empire, that's imperialism. Roman Empire, that is imperialism. The British settling the 13 colonies of the United States. That is imperialism. Alexander the Great dominating a whole heck of a lot of land. That's imperialism. Those are all examples in imperialism. But we're just going to focus on about the 17, 1800s until the 1940s for this unit. So you might be thinking, what's the difference between imperialism and colonialism? They are very closely related. So let me tell you the difference. So imperialism, that is the economic, political, and or social idea of taking over another country. Colonialism is the physical stuff, okay? That is physical building of colonies and the physical action of dominating that territory. So for example, under British imperialism, which is the idea, the 13 colonies were built by the British in Eastern North America. Okay, so they're very closely related. One's the idea, one's physical. So imperialism has happened throughout history, but like I said, for this unit, we're just going to focus on about the 1800s. We'll dip into a little bit into the 1700s and through the 1940s, actually. So post-World War II is a big time period for a lot of these countries getting their independence. So let's talk about the start of imperialism in the 1800s. There are two main reasons. First reason, European competition with other European countries. Second reason, social Darwinism. That is the idea that Europeans thought that they were superior to everyone else. So 
In the early 1800s, slave trade was made illegal in European countries and the United States. So the kind of the tricky loophole in this one with the U.S. is that the U.S. could still have slaves in the United States before the Civil War happened, of course, but no more could be stolen and imported from Africa. So that's kind of like the weird U.S. loophole that they had until the Civil War cut that down. So merchants were also looking for new commodities and items to sell. So they turned their attention to areas with smaller governments or no European influences. So such as like the continent of Africa, Southeast Asia, India, Australia, and then later on to Latin and South America. Um, European countries also wanted cheap labor and they also wanted expensive goods to trade because the more expensive goods they had to trade meant the more money they had meant the more power they would receive. They also wanted more land because more land meant more natural resources to exploit. Those include metals like copper, tin, gold, aluminum, rubber trees, lumber, cotton farmland, ivory, which is made out of animal tusks, diamond, and opioids, which we'll learn about in the next video. All right, so also resources would be shipped back to the colonizers' European factories. Those European factory workers would make the final good those final goods would be sold to the global economy, and that meant big, big profits for the European colonizers. Here's an example of which, which would be rubber. Rubber is most commonly found in Congo. We'll learn all about the Congo um, in some later videos. So example, Congolese Africans would unwillingly be forced to extract rubber from rubber trees. This then would have the colonizer send the rubber to the factories in Belgium. The factories in Belgium would have their workers make it into water-resistant clothes and shoes, tires for bikes, and then later on cars, and also machinery belts. So that is kind of how the, like, the flow of commerce happened during imperialism. So another thing to talk about with imperialism is nationalism. So nationalism is still a word that we probably used today. So nationalism is people's greatest loyalty should not be with the king or queen, but instead be loyal with the nation of the people. So having everyone in that nation, having a shared common culture and history. So nationalism also believed that a country's common culture should be spread amongst the world. Like if they're so great, everyone should have this greatness. This leads to colonies around the world thinking that they're spreading their country's greatness and culture. All right, then we talk about social Darwinism. I know we talked about this last unit, but we're going to talk about it again. Again, this is the false belief that some people were born better than others, making them superior. Those who were seen by society as being born into status and wealth meant that they had wealth and success and they were just simply superior to others, although that was a big false lie. Also, during this time, Europeans falsely believed that their white race was superior to all others. Okay, This would lead to racism the belief that one race is superior to others. So this is kind of like my weird scenario that I thought up of myself. So in European leaders in wealthy minds, this belief was their justification to colonizing and exploiting Africans, Indians, Australians, and Asians, Asians in Southeast Asia. So think of this, like if Queen Victoria, who was a huge European colonizer, was like, hmm, I have superior military technology and ways of extracting precious natural resources. I'm going to colonize you. And the colonizes were like, ah, screw you. I don't want your help. And Queen Victoria was like, hmm, too bad. I want your goods and labor. And then violence and oppression ensues. It's pretty much kind of how that went down. So there are some other aspects of social Darwinism with imperialism as well. Europeans believed it was their duty to colonize and modernize non-European territories. Although that was 
turned out to be false. And they also falsely believe Europeans were born with stronger bodies and smarter. So here's an example. It wasn't just Europeans as well, by the way. The United States will have a role in this as well. So this is a political cartoon example. So as you can see here, this woman right here is supposed to represent Cuba, which is just south of the United States in the Caribbean. And Cuba was colonized by Spain back in the 1400s. So this is supposed to be like the United States. He's protecting Cuba from the Spanish. Yeah. We'll learn about the U.S. a little bit later on. So, some really good questions to ask about imperialism. Did territories who get got threatened by imperialism fight back? Yes, oh my gosh, yes, they did fight back. We will learn about that with like the Zulu and Boer War. Was it always successful? The vast majority of the time, it was not. There was one really important exception to this, which is Menelik II of Ethiopia. And why? Why was this fight back against imperialist powers so unsuccessful? It's pretty much because the Europeans had the better military technology. They had the guns. So one of the big game changers in all this was the Maxim gun. This was invented back in 1884. It was the first automatic machine gun. So it was able to kill people at high rates, but also to inflict fear among the people. So during imperialism from the 1800s to 1940s, the steam engine also became very popular. So here's a question for you. How would the steam engine be helpful to colonizers in exploiting the land and labor force? And don't give me any, I don't know. Just take your best guess. So the steam engine was super important, especially when it came to transportation. So steam engines were used in trains, cable cars for mining, and steamboats. Steamboats are really, really important, especially when we talk about the Congo. So the Congo has a ton of rivers, and it was like the only way to get to and from places in the Congo was through the rivers. So steamboats were really important because Europeans were able to navigate the waterways both upstream and downstream on the rivers. So that was a huge game changer. I know for us today, that seems like nothing, right? But you got to think, that's really important. Navigating both ways on a river. Mm -hmm. Also, steam engines were used to build railroad tracks deep into jungles and forests. Also, to ship supplies to and from the colonies and to transport armies if there was an uprising. So let's look into see what we should expect for Unit 13. So here we are now on U13L2. Next up, we're going to do U13L3, Imperialism in India. U13L4, Imperialism in Africa. Uh, you don't have school on April 5th. Awesome job. I do. Yay. Uh, then Monday, April 8th, you're going to do U13L5, African Women Primary Source Reading. U13L6, King Leopold II. Then U13L7, the U.S.'s role in imperialism, which is really interesting. I hope you enjoy that slideshow because it is really interesting one. Uh, April 11th, you have work time. And then as you could probably expect, Unit 13 Summative, which is the news reporter summative. I'll explain that more in Lesson 7. So now let's talk a little bit about imperialism in Australia and New Zealand. So I teach world history, right? And you're in world history class. I don't think we've ever mentioned Australia and New Zealand before this. So I feel really bad. So that's why I'm like, uh, maybe we should talk about Australia and New Zealand at least once. So uh, before the British came in 1788, there was about 650,000 hunter-gatherer natives called Melanesians in Australia. And there are about 250,000 Maori natives as well. And they mostly did like fishing and farming. So the Melanesians and Maori people settled Australia and New Zealand about 40,000 years ago. So the British colonized them in about 1788. And instead of ruling over the natives, the British decided just to kill them off or just simply kick them off their native land. 
So just like we talked about with North and South America, the Maori and Melanesian people were very vulnerable to European diseases. So by the 1890s, there's only about 93,000 Melanesians and 42,000 Maorians left. So the first British people who settled into Australia were actually criminals. Uh, there were 736 convicts convicts at first, and 188 of them were women, which is interesting. In 1851, there was gold discovered in Australia. And if you remember the gold rush from the U.S. and U.S. history, it's going to be the same thing. A bunch of people are going to come and think they're going to strike it rich with gold. So in nine years, starting in 1860, more than one million British and Chinese people settled in Australia. Think of that, nine years, one million people, oh my gosh. And even more, by 1875, there were two million people in Australia. Wow. So they didn't come just for gold. They also came to trap animal furs. So during this time, seal top hats were on the rage. Also whaling. So sperm whales were used to make things like oil for soap, lamps, and perfumes. Also, the bones from the whales were made for women's corsets, which are those, like, things that go under their dresses. I don't know. I don't know. Historical clothes. Anyway, it also took three-month ship ride from Britain to Australia. So these people were dedicated coming over. So in 1897, the Aborigines people were forced into reservations. So the British government stripped them from the right to vote. So they did something that the United States did too, very similarly, where a person would have to read and write fluent English in order to vote. So that made many natives ineligible to vote. So they did reserve four political positions for Aborigines in the lower house of the legislature. Today, there are 26 Ab Aborigines politicians in Australia's 227-seat parliament, which is more, but still not a lot. So Australia and New Zealand have a really unique relationship with Britain, and this still exists today. So Britain actually encouraged them to make their own government, which they did, Australia, Australia in 1901 and New Zealand in 1907. So today, Britain technically still rules over Australia and New Zealand. There was never any legislation signed in Britain saying that Australia and New Zealand were free. But Britain really doesn't interfere with Australia or New Zealand since World War II. So let's wrap it up for today. Today we learned about imperialism, colonialism, nationalism, social Darwinism, imperialism in Australia and New Zealand. Next up, you're going to watch U13L3 at Puzzle about imperialism in India. Make sure you follow along with their study guide. And of course, if you have questions, comments, or just simply want to learn more, email us. That's why we're here. All right. Thanks for watching, everybody. Bye.